If you're like most retirees, most pre-retirees, most successful investors for that matter, then you probably have it pre-wired in you to save more and spend less. Today, we're going to share some new ideas with you on how to get you to open up that wallet on things that truly matter. The title of today's podcast, Three Techniques to Help Retirees Spend More. Let's get into the content, buddy. We got Jamie Hopkins coming at us here. Uh, an article is featured here in Think Advisor. And Jamie Hopkins, boy, that's a that's a long time ago he was featured on the Retire With Purpose podcast. I believe, if my notes are right, Casey, episode 29. Was it all when, the way back When you were a baby wow. face basement podcaster. We were a couple beardless men sitting around having this conversation. Yeah, huh? Jamie, uh, Jamie's a good one, though. And uh, I love the content he puts out. Puts a different yeah. spin on things. That's one thing I like about this article. It just puts a little, slightly different spin on things. And this is, is something yeah. that we can relate to because we do see this. We do see retirees that have plenty of money that are afraid to spend. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've found, I mean, one of the things I think that made my dad such uh, a, a great financial advisor and so many people praised him for it and I watched him do it for years uh, was just how good he was at encouraging people to spend money and not just developing strategies, but really the psychological aspect of, of getting them over this hurdle of just focusing on saving and that spending is a bad thing and getting them to realize at the end of the day why they saved the money. Why did you save the money? You saved it to spend yeah. it. And at the time, you know, in especially until today, I mean, interest rates are much higher today, but if we rewind the clock 15 years ago, they weren't this high. Five years ago, they weren't this high. Mm -hmm. And what one of those biggest concerns of a lot of retirees was and still is to this day is I saying, I don't want to spend my principal. Uh, well, why'd you save the principal if you didn't want to spend the principal? So you have five million bucks today and you're 65. So spending interest only today is a pretty darn good living, right? You might mm, sure. be, have spendable income of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And then in your 90s, you still have $5 million, and you're going to leave that behind to your heirs? Is that the goal? Is that the priority? For some, that is the priority, and that is the goal. But I find that the vast majority of uh, retirees, that isn't the priority, and that isn't yeah, the goal. Right. And they've just been trained that, well, you never spend your principal. You never spend your principal. Why don't you spend your principal? Because if you never dip into that principal, then you never have to worry about running out of money, right? Mm. So it ultimately goes back to the fear of running out out. And so if they never dip into principal or they never touch it in the first place, or they don't tap into it for five or 10 years, I hear all these things. I don't want to dip into my 401k yet. It's, it's like, Casey, we're, hard, we're hardwired, like save good, spend bad. Yeah. Just like just forever. Caveman, yeah. Right? Forever. It, when it becomes a caveman mentality, when you know, we've spent, say, 40 years trying to pinch every penny in saving and never taking withdrawal from our savings, never taking withdrawal from our 401k. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to shift that mentality. 40 years of habits that have been ingrained and now we have to break those habits. What are mm -hmm. some what are some of the rules? You, you love the habit stuff. You know, what do we have to do to break a habit? What, are, what are the things that we have to do to break a habit? It's Just not stop doing it. it. It doesn't happen on <laughs> you day You have to one, build a routine, right? right? You have to build a whole new habit. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. That takes months, if not years, to build a new habit. And how about people that learn to work out, people that learn to eat right, people that quit sugar, people that quit alcohol, people that quit smoking. All of those things happen because they formed a new habit. Many times they've eased into that new habit. They didn't just go cold turkey, mm -hmm. you know, they actually built a routine for themselves in their lives that helped them get on a new habit plan that put them in a place that was better for them in life. Yeah. So, so they were given permission, right? And I think this is what Jamie's really getting at here is, is talking about having permission to spend, right? Having that, having that confidence to really step into retirement and be able to spend on things that we want to spend money on. The reason you saved and worked so hard for all those years, that's really what people are after, right? They want the confidence to be able to spend freely. And not to, not enough financial advisors are having that conversation with clients. No, it's and all they, about rates of return and the market's yeah. up 20% or it's down 20%. It's like uh, yeah. nobody has any confidence when they're looking at the stock market every day. Think about every, sitting down every evening, putting on the nightly news. Oh, the Dow Jones was up 130 points. It was down 330 points. Like 
every day you're inundated with the volatility of the stock market. Well, and I think financial advisors, we should maybe we should be compensated on how much our clients are actually spending every year mm. rather than how much they have invested with us. I like it. You know, because I do think there's a good chunk of advisors out there that are biased. This is clearly not every advisor, but you know, they're Well, it's not in their best interest for the clients to spend interest. it, right? For you to spend your principal. Hello. Right? Yeah. And so anyways. So we should title this Think Advisor. It should be Think Advisor, think, think, advisor, think. think. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's what helped us grow so quickly is we did approach it with a different mentality, which was let's put together a spending plan. Let's put together an income strategy because that's what this time of your life is about. It's not about in putting together an investment strategy, an accumulation strategy. You pass that time. Now it's about putting together an income strategy that allows you to spend as much money as possible each and every year. But as we talk about ingraining habits, you know, we're going to talk about three different techniques here on how to start to get yourself to spend a little bit more. And most of these, really, they're all psychological uh, and in ways of thinking. And that first one is to test it out. And I think this is probably <laughs> the most habit-forming type of uh, technique that Jamie has pitched here. Yeah, he's talking about a phase. Well, first and foremost, he's talking about a phased retirement. Maybe you, maybe you go part-time, maybe you go limited time, maybe you go half-time and just test the waters, right? You're testing the waters of retirement, and that's limiting the amount of withdrawals that you need to take from your portfolio. Maybe you still need to supplement your part-time income or your half-time income, but you're doing this in a way that's a little more regimented and you're not, you're, you're dipping the toes in the water. Yeah, so you need 60,000 annual income. So you cut yourself down to part time mm -hmm. so that you're making, say, 30,000 a year. And then you supplement that income with 401k distributions or investment distributions of some sort. And we've seen this work really well. I can think of multiple families mm -hmm. off the top of my head who, you know, maybe they phased it in where one spouse retire, retires first, the other one goes two or three years later, and they really get their handle on their spending and they kind of see what life is all about, but they phased into it. They've stepped into it. Yeah. Well, and I think the strangest thing, uh, this is a new one. Okay. So Jamie discusses uh, putting money in your 401k and taking it out at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you just get used to taking a distribution from your 401k. So you're putting 20,000 a year into your 401k and at the same time, you're setting up distributions from that 401k and taking out 20000 at the Isn't same time. Isn't that so interesting? I, I think it's a great twist on things because the, the idea is the balance stays the same. What you're putting in, you're taking out, but it's getting you used to withdrawing, withholding taxes and understanding how that process works. I understand works. the tax. But I understand the psychological benefits. The tax benefits are a problem. Yeah, I yeah. think most accounts are going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, what are you, what yeah. you could consider is you could... I mean, in some instances, you might be able to roll those dollars over to an IRA. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're actually seeing some distributions from the 401k, but you're, you're not getting You're feeling the distributions, but you're not actually being taxed on it. Okay. I yeah, like it. I get I don't think I would ever encourage that mm -hmm. strategy, but it is an interesting one that most people probably have never thought about. But there also might be a reason that nobody ever thought about it. If you'd like to take the information that you've gleaned here to the next level all you have to do is this. Click the link in the description and schedule a 15-minute phone consultation with an advisor on our team where you can get answers to your own unique questions and concerns. Technique number two, uh, describing, understanding your needs, your wants, and your wishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not all spending is equal. No. And as Jamie explains, and he explained on the podcast with us, that, you know, Mental accounting is so crucial, and I have found this to be so crucial. You know, so I, I spoke with, uh, you know, my dad was talking about this the other day. He said, I think what really has led to the success has been uh, the concept of purpose-based planning, the concept of taking each one of your assets and assigning it a very specific purpose, knowing that's my emergency money, that's my income money, that's my long-term inflation protection money, that's my estate planning money, that piece is for the heirs, that piece is for long-term care. You know, having a specific asset allocation that is purpose-based uh, lets us open up each one of those investments. For instance, we take a look at our brokerage statement, the market's down, maybe we're down 20%. Mm -hmm. We go, that's okay because I don't need this. This is my long-term money. Yes. However, if everything was in that one pile and now it's down 20%, you go, well, am I going to run out of money? So you have this first piece, which is I think, mental accounting on the basis of 
this is specifically what each one of these assets is for. Uh, and then you can drill down and get a little bit more granular and talk about the actual income strategy itself, where you're building different types of income strategies. That, that one income strategy could be, as Jamie discussed here, where you have needs, wants, and wishes. So you have your needs met by, say, Social Security, maybe pension, maybe guaranteed income product. And you have all of those needs met because the biggest fear that most have is not having their needs met in retirement, becoming a burden on mm -hmm. a family member. So we put together a strategy so that no matter how much you spend, all of your needs are always met. And then we get to the once section and maybe that and it's us taking on a little bit more risk. Maybe this is a dividend-based strategy. We're spending the down the dividends, and we have some ones that we're funding out of this more at-risk portfolio. And then we have our wishes, the things that we're investing for for the long term that, hey, if we take on some risk and it doesn't come to fruition, that's okay. But if we you know, end up taking... If, if we end up taking the risk and achieving that goal, then we can have those, you know, dreams or wishes actually come true. So, that, I mean, that's one way to think about it. Yeah, I really love the concept. And what I've found with, I can think of one couple off the top of my head, and, and I've heard this discussion several times. We start talking about the monthly spend, and, and the spouse that takes care of the checkbook says, well, I can tell you what it is. It's about 9000 a month. And then the other spouse says, no, there's no way we spend that much. She's like, yeah. That's how much we spend every month. So what we'll do is we'll go back in and pull, say, six months of their their banking statements. They can do this on their own or we can do it together. It's kind of like marriage counseling. But <laughs> we, we get together and we go through those expenses and we just line item out, needs, wants, wishes. And then you what you're creating is you're understanding, okay, how much do I have to come in the door every month to meet those needs? Sometimes you take care of that with lifetime income. I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So you, you, you create different income streams for those needs, those wants, those wishes. Maybe those wishes are just trips. In this, this family's instance, they took two big trips every year. So what we're doing is sending a, a $10,000 distribution in the spring and one in the fall to take care of those needs. So it really gives ownership to the spend, which is very important because we, we both spouses have to be on the same page. And two, it gives it gives purpose to the dollars into the income streams and makes sure everybody understands why we're doing what we're doing. So it brings yeah. clarity to the plan. Yeah, I, it, it just feels a little, un, it sounds cool, but mm -hmm. it, in reality, I don't see that actually becoming a practice that people want to participate in. You know, on your way to retirement, yeah, you know, this sounds great. You know, I'll set up a bucket for needs and wants and wishes and separate out these different buckets. And what I find 99% of the time is needs, wants, and wishes are all the same. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I want it all and I'm going to have it when I want to have it. And I'm not going to feel comfortable spending unless I know all of those different things are met. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see a lot of wish stuff, right? I, by the time that someone gets to be 60, 65, you know, your spending has been well ingrained in you for a lifetime. You don't dramatically change your spending. Maybe you spend a little bit more for a few years. You go on some more vacations, take the family and do some neat things, and maybe you buy that dream car. But it's not something that persists. You know, what, what I find more likely is, in, in what I see in practice, is more people saying, well, guaranteed all my income. And those are the people that tend to spend the most and enjoy their retirement the most. And then I'd say the second category of people are that say, well, over the first 10 years, I want to guarantee that I'm going to be able to spend a lot more than I'm mm -hmm. going to spend in the following 10 and the following 10 after that, where we have this kind of graded spending plan, but it's still, you know, at least we have five, 10, 15 years where we know we have this guaranteed bucket. And now we have a license to spend and we still have participated in mental accounts because we are taking risk with some dollars we don't that are maybe part of the income plan, but we don't need them as part mm -hmm. of the income plan for you know, 10, 15 years down the road. Well, t I think you bring up an interesting comment on the wishes. And I think the one thing that I see in practice is not so much the wish of doing bucket list things in retirement, but it's we wish to help the kids. So you had mentioned, yeah. you know, when you've got a million or five million or five hundred thousand, and they want to leave that that basis to to the kids. You know, a lot of families are saying today, you know, we don't necessarily want to leave a whole lot behind, but we want to be able to help. We wish that we could help today when the kids actually need it. When they need a down payment on a house, they need help with braces for the for the grandkids and things like that. So they wish that they could help more. And this frees up those purse strings when you kind of separate out these expenses in that way. All right. Well, let's uh, go to technique number three: go beyond success or failure failure 
metrics. I love that. So as a financial advisor, a lot of times you're ingrained in all these fancy softwares and Monte Carlo simulations that are going, okay, this person has an 85% chance of success. Well, what does that mean? There's a 15% chance of failure. So what Jamie Hopkins is talking about is building in guaranteed income streams, whether that's social security, pensions, annuities, to make sure that there's never a failure. But it can still be a failure, right? It's a, but it's how we define the failure. So we got a 15% chance of failure. What's that mean though? Well, that means the software said you ran out of investment dollars. You so ran out you, of investable assets. You don't assets. have investable mm -hmm. assets, but that's not a complete failure, right? I think it's just, it's, a, it's, it's misworded. So now that person has to live on say social, social security, social security, maybe only. guaranteed income. Right. You know, maybe you've put together a, a guaranteed income solution. Maybe you have an annuity. Maybe you have Social Security. Maybe you have some pension. So even though you don't have any more investable assets, you still have income. So is that a total failure? It doesn't seem like a total failure if I can still stay in retirement, yeah. but maybe I have and to cut back a little bit. That's the point, right? Is sitting down and understanding at what point is it not a failure? Is it five grand a month? Is it seven grand a month? Is it eight grand a month? Yeah. If you have that guaranteed, but yet you're spending say ten or twelve thousand on the front end of retirement, if if it's not a failure to still have five or six, then guarantee up to that point, and then you know that your plan's never going well, to fail. Even people that take a 100% investment based strategy where you know all of their income is investment based you know what i i don't see this holding true that well they continue to spend at a constant rate regardless of what happens in the market when i'm working with people they have an investment based strategy they're very risk oriented so they were comfortable with the fact of not their portfolio going down what they were comfortable with was their income going down uh, due to the portfolio going down in value and so what what happens when we get the worst is they go, well, you know what, I think I'm gonna cut back a little bit this year. We're not gonna go on that vacation this year. Or, you know, we were going to you know, remodel the house. We're gonna put that off for a couple <laughs> more years. There isn't, for yes. people that have a higher risk tolerance, that is a higher risk tolerance that as it pertains to their willingness to have flexibility to in their yeah. spent mm -hmm. expenses. So they right. have a willingness to cut expenses and they do cut expenses. And so even if the, simulation shows why well, you've got a 90% chance of success. Well, that's assuming that you don't make adjustments along the way when there's a down market, which is again, pretty unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So all of this, you know, it's thinking about your thinking, it's understanding your strategy, it's understanding where you are. So we covered three really hard strategies. One, test it out. Number two, needs once wishes. Number three, go beyond success or failure metrics. If you want to link to this article, check it out in the show notes, retirewithpurpose.com. While you're there, get yourself signed up for weekend reading. We'll catch you right back here next week. My name is Casey Weed, your host, where it is my mission to help deliver clarity and purpose and elevate meaning in your life through personal and practical financial strategies. We do that in a couple of different ways if you're new to the podcast. Number one, every other Monday we release a long form interview based podcast with one of our world class guests. And then every Friday, my good friend Marshall and Johnson, we get together and we sit down and we talk about a trending topic that comes from our weekend reading for retirees email series. We like to highlight one of those articles, but you have to get yourself signed up for this email so that you get not just that article, but the other three articles as well and all the other great stuff that comes along with it. You have those four articles with summaries and takeaways. You also have webinars. You have white paper giveaways, book giveaways, event invitations, all types of great stuff to help keep you on top of what matters in retirement. Get yourself signed up super easy by shooting us a text, texting the key letters WR to 866-482-9559 or just visit retirewithpurpose.com. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe rate and give us a review.